Hello, and welcome again to The Elephant. I'm Kevin Kaners. Life on Earth stretches back at least 3.5 billion years. And since it first emerged all that time ago, there have been five big extinction events, traumatic periods where, for one reason or another, in a geological moment, the equilibrium on Earth was turned upside down, and both the abundance and biodiversity of life on the planet plummeted. The most recent of these extinctions also happens to be the one that we're most familiar with, the asteroid that collided with the Earth some 66 million years ago, killing the dinosaurs and about 75% of all plant and animal species with it. It may not seem like we live in similarly chaotic times, but today, many biologists now believe that we're in the midst of a sixth great extinction event. Only this time, the asteroid is us. That's the unsettling reality that Elizabeth Colbert explores in her book, The Sixth Extinction. In it, Colbert travels to the ends of the Earth, from deep inside the Amazon rainforest to a remote island of the Great Barrier Reef. And in each case, guided by expert scientists, she discovers how human behavior is irreversibly disrupting the delicate balance of life. Through things like introducing non-native species, habitat destruction, and now man-made climate change, we are collectively wrecking havoc on Earth's ecosystems, and with profound implications. It's believed by the end of the century, we will have lost between 20 to 50% of all living species on Earth. And as Colbert puts it, in the process, we're putting our own survival in danger. Elizabeth Colbert is a staff writer at The New Yorker, and The Sixth Extinction won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction. I reached Elizabeth Colbert by Skype. Well, Elizabeth Colbert, welcome to The Elephant. Thanks for having me. You know, if there's one thing I came away with in reading the book, it's the sense that we live in remarkable times. What sets the era that we're in apart? I'm gratified that that was the message you took from the book because it definitely is the message of the book uh, that, that was intended. And the reason that we live in remarkable times, though we may not be able to appreciate it because we are habituated to the times we live in, it doesn't seem remarkable to us. But the world is at one of these very rare moments when it is changing very, very rapidly. And the reason it is changing very, very rapidly is, is because of us. And I could offer you many different ways in which that is occurring, in which we are affecting that change, but you know, just to use one, by driving our cars and shoveling coal into our power plants and burning through lots of natural gas, we're, we're taking these fossil fuels, which all began with organic matter um, that was you know, buried and sort of transformed in this interesting way over hundreds of millions of years. And we are very rapidly, so within a matter of centuries, we could potentially burn through you know, virtually all the carbon deposits that are out there, uh, fossil fuel deposits, we're, we're burning through them, we're transferring all that carbon back into the atmosphere. So we're, as I put it in the book, and as you know, other people have put it, it's not an original idea. We're, we're running geological history backwards, but we're doing so at really, really high speeds. So taking you know, these processes that took hundreds of millions of years to run in one direction, we're running them backwards very quickly. And that is an extraordinary thing and, and, and very, very rarely happens in geological history because when you think about it, uh, if you think about it, how could those that carbon be liberated? It's very, very difficult to think of how that would happen without human intervention. So you you mean we're we're running the record backwards in that slowly all this this carbon that was in the air was was taken out from organic matter and now we're releasing it again. It was taken out by organic matter. So I'm a plant. I um, take up carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, right? That's how we oxygenated our planet. You know, all of the oxygen that we have is a result of photosynthesis. And that process began a really long time ago with the, you know, quote unquote, invention of photosynthesis about 2 billion years ago. And over time, now most of our fossil fuels are not that old, but they're, they are in many cases, hundreds of millions of years old. So, you know, plants took up carbon, they died and they didn't you know sort of fully decompose and release that carbon back into the air and that's how we get fossil fuels through these accidents of biology and geology that combine to give us fossil fuel deposits and if you're a geologist you know you sort of know what those conditions are and where to look for them and blah 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 that's a very lucrative thing to do and so that carbon got 
got basically sequestered away from the atmosphere. And when we burn it, we're simply releasing it back into the atmosphere. So yes, so we're taking carbon that was was taken up by plants over a very, very long time, and, and we're shooting it back into the atmosphere. Well, so the book is called The Sixth Extinction, which, uh, as we'll get into, you know, perhaps we're the cause of the, the six humanity. But to put where we're at in context, can you just tell me a bit about the, the first five extinctions? What sort of things happened? What, what caused mass die-offs on the Earth? Well, that's not, you know, an entirely settled question. I mean, that's a very sort of active uh, area of research precisely because of this mounting evidence that we are in, you know, another mass extinction. So obviously the question of what caused previous ones seems to become a lot more pressing. But to the best of our knowledge, the first one of these, they're, they're called the big five. So there are these five what are called major mass extinctions. And then there are lots of smaller extinction events in, in the record. Um, but the first of the so-called big five occurred about 440 million years ago. And at that point, you know, there was no life on land, really. Life on land really didn't exist. So that was a very devastating effect for marine life. And it seems the best that people can piece together the evidence, because we're talking about an event that happened quite quite a long time ago, is that that was caused by a sudden glaciation, sudden cold snap. And there's evidence of this glaciation in, in interestingly disparate parts of the world because the world has been dramatically rearranged since in, in the last 440 million years owing to plate tectonics. That's event number one. Now, what caused that glaciation? That is a mystery. No one quite knows why we got that event. Um, and the, the, the third of these events was, a, was the biggest, the worst. It's, it was, it's sometimes called the mother of, of mass extinctions, and that happened at the end of what's known as the Permian period. And that one is a very scary one. Um, it came close to sort of wiping out, you know, multicellular life altogether. And the best that scientists can ascertain, it seems to have been caused by a really, really massive release of carbon dioxide. Now, how that carbon was released is, is still a very much a matter of sort of active research, but um, that's a very scary one because not only, you know, was it absolutely devastating event for life on Earth and ended what's known as the Paleozoic era, so it ended this whole, you know, sort of major biological period, but there are, you know, very, very frightening parallels to what we are doing, and people have calculated, you know, how much carbon was being released on an annual basis during this extinction event, which probably lasted many thousands of years. And it was probably less than we are releasing right now. Now it went on for many thousands of years. So, you know, we'd have to keep burning carbon perhaps for many thousands of years to, to reach the same level of a total release. But it's not clear, you know, what matters here most, total release or speed of release. Um, and if it's speed, then we are doing a really, really good job of sort of, you know, potentially imitating the end Permian extinction. And the last, number five, which is, you know, the most famous um, and dear to our hearts, as it were, is the extinction event that ended the Cretaceous and did in the dinosaurs and a lot of other big groups of animals, too. And that, it's pretty widely agreed, was caused by an asteroid impact. And, and as you mentioned in the book, some scientists say that we're now the, the asteroid. Yes, exactly. And, and, and obviously our effect is not, you know, exactly that of an asteroid. But one of the points that, that, that scientists are sort of trying to make with that is that we are changing the world really, really fast. So that, you know, what we're doing is, is obviously not, you know, one massive asteroid impact, but many millions of years from now when this our whole human you know era is is compressed down to a very very thin layer of sediment it may well look like an asteroid impact because we're changing things you know in a geological scale very 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 quickly so that you know what, what may take 100 or 200 or 300 or you know even a thousand years will look virtually instantaneous in the fossil record now as you hinted at before we we live in remarkable times, but of course, it, it feels more or less normal to us. We don't have the sort of perception to to feel changes that 
that while geologically are happening in an instant are happening over over years and decades. And I want to ask you like how we can get a sense of that we are indeed changing because you know if we we just live our or- ordinary lives it doesn't feel like animals are are dying all around us. Um, It doesn't necessarily appear that we're having the impact that we are. Was there any particular uh, experience you had in the the writing of the book or talking to scientists that sort of drove home to you viscerally how we're changing the planet? Yes, I mean, I I think I think you're making a very good point. And that, to be honest, is precisely the, you know, the point, as it were, of writing the book is to try to bring that home to people, because especially since many of us live in urban areas and areas that have been transformed. If you're in Europe, you know, humans transformed Europe quite a long time ago. And so in some parts of the world, it even might appear that things are, you know, getting animals are returning in some parts of Europe, you know, for example, wolves are returning that haven't been there in 100 years, you may say, okay, well, you know, actually, things are, you know, sort of getting better. But you really need to look at the totality of the globe. Uh, to get a sense of the scale of what we're doing. Now, how in one's own life does this message come home to one? Well, I think many people have had the experience of something that they used to, you know, see regularly or or, or something being transformed in, in even in the course of their of their own lifetimes. And I can offer you, you know, a couple of examples from my own backyard. I live in the northeastern US. I look out onto a mountainside, and that mountain was completely clear cut. You know, probably a hundred years ago, it looks very different now. We have a you know second growth forest there. It looks pretty you know wild, even though it is certainly not. And two animals that I used to see really, really frequently. One were bats, just ordinary uh, little brown bats, which have been absolutely devastated um, in the northeastern U.S. by a fungal disease that was probably brought over from Europe. We're just talking in the last decade that populations in the northeastern U.S. have have crashed. So you can genuinely notice that where I live. I mean, you just don't see very many bats anymore. You've seen a couple, but you used to see them all the time. Um, And another example is a monarch butterfly, which used to come to my backyard, you know, right now, this season that we're in, sort of end of July, beginning of August, I would see monarchs out there. I've often raised them. I would, you know, collect with my kids the caterpillars and we'd watch them go through metamorphosis, which is, a, you know, just staggeringly amazing experience. Uh, and now monarch populations have crashed and you don't see them in the Northeast anymore. So just in the last couple of years, we suddenly lost all our monarchs. So, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone because I you know live in one particular place where I you know know the sort of fauna and those are two very vivid examples I think to, to people who live you know in New England as I do but everywhere you go in the world unfortunately there are stories like this and I'm sure that many of your listeners will have their own stories. Now, now of course uh, a big reason why there's been so many extinctions is, is partly as, as you say in the book, we, we've kind of reformed uh, the one giant continent through mass travel and, and introducing species both deliberately and by, by accident. Um, and then there's climate change. And I was wondering if, if there's a way to think of these two different sort of causes of extinction. Which proportion would you say is caused by climate and, and which proportion caused by, by other factors of, of just our spread around the world? Well, so far, you know, to really be honest, I don't think that any extinctions have been conclusively uh, traced to climate change yet. Now we're, you know, in the early phases of this and a lot of range contractions have been documented and those are sort of precursors to extinction. But I don't think that any one would say we have any total extinction of the species yet. Uh, that can be traced only and directly to climate change. But going forward, climate change is expected to become a major driver of extinction because there's a lot of warming still in the pipeline, and we are also still burning through a lot of carbon dioxide. So so those are question marks. There's, there's sort of question marks around climate change that in part have to do with you know how much carbon we eventually burn you know are we going to go you know the end permian route uh or are we going to restrain ourselves a lot sooner than that so that you know is just an open question to a certain extent now 
in terms of moving things around the world, it turns out that moving things around the world, if you look at actually documented extinctions that have you know, already taken place as animals are completely gone, uh, never to return, um, invasive species, introduced species turn out to be a major driver of extinction. And this uh, is particularly the case on islands where you had a lot of naive, what are called naive populations, animals that evolved without, in some cases, without, you know, any major predators. Then we introduced something like a mongoose or a rat or a, a weasel, and they went, you know, absolutely berserk and killed everything. And there's many, many bird species, ground nesting bird species, for example, that are gone as a result of that. Um, and then there are many species that are gone because we simply kill them off. And everyone is familiar with those, you know, the dodo, uh, the great auk, the stellar sea cow, unfortunately, is a, it's a pretty long list of animals that we simply, you know, killed off. And then obviously another huge driver of extinction right now and potentially the major driver of extinction, though this is also harder to, to document, is habitat destruction. You know, when you drain a wetland, when you cut down a forest, it's not really very difficult to imagine that everything that depended on that little ecosystem is going to be affected. Now, when you do it on a small scale, you might cause local extinction, right? Everything that lived in that little swamp um, is gone, or many things are gone, um, but maybe they're in the next swamp over. But, you know, as we drain that next swamp over and the next swamp over and the next swamp over, uh, you can imagine that the effects just multiply until eventually you get a global extinction. I want you to tell me about some of the places you actually go uh, in your, your research for the book. There, there's a, an island off uh, the coast of Australia called One Tree Island. Could you tell me about what you were doing there and what you found? Yeah, sure. One, One Tree Island is an extraordinary place. It's a tiny little island off the coast of Australia, as you say, in, in, the, in the very southern tip of, of the Great Barrier Reef. And the Great Barrier Reef is this collection of reefs that stretches for, you know, 1,500 miles off the coast of Australia. And every once in a while, for whatever reason, an island has, has formed that sort of peaks above the waves, very low, very vulnerable little islands. And this, this one is a really tiny one. And you can't get there except if you have sort of a, a permit as a researcher. And I was fortunate enough to go with some researchers there. And they were there to study the reef. Um, so this island is, is is just a little piece of the reef, basically, that, you know, was sort of thrown up by a storm and so therefore is higher than the water because reefs usually only grow to the point of the water level at low tide because they, they don't like to be exposed. Um, these are little creatures, you know, little aquatic creatures. They don't like to be above the water. Uh, so what they were looking at there was... What effect, and this is an issue we have not yet discussed, but it is a major part of the book because it is a major driver of extinction, or, or I should say potentially a major driver of extinction, and it is the flip side of climate change, and that is what carbon emissions are doing to the ocean. So a lot of our carbon dioxide that we're throwing up there by, you know, doing all the things that we do, uh, driving and lighting our houses, etc., a lot of it ends up in the water. It just gets absorbed by the water. And when you dissolve carbon dioxide in water, you get an acid, carbonic acid. And so we're changing the chemistry of the oceans on a very, very large scale everywhere. This is happening and it's measurable. And it's once again, it's indisputable. Um, so we can actually see the amount of carbon that's being absorbed by the oceans. We, we know the level. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, first of all, it's, it's very predictable if you, once again, do, do sort of basic chemistry based on what's, what's called the partial pressure of CO2. You know how much CO2, if you know how much CO2 you're adding to the atmosphere, you, you can uh, calculate pretty closely how much you're going to get absor absorbed by the surface waters of the ocean just because of the gas will cross that boundary and diffuse into the water. But, but in addition to that, we have also, people have also been measuring it. So they've been measuring the chemistry of the ocean. You just stick, you know, measuring tools into the water and you can see how the chemistry is changing. So that, you know, is very, very well established, very well known. And what these guys were looking at at One Tree was how that change in water chemistry is affecting the growth rate 
of reefs. So reefs are, are pretty complicated objects. They are formed by these tiny little gelatinous creatures who excrete, in effect, the mineral calcium carbonate, and that forms this reef structure. And it gets harder and harder to make calcium carbonate when the water is becoming more and more acidified. Uh, and once again, that's, that's sort of basic you know, biochemistry, I guess you'd say. And so every, a lot, a lot of creatures out there in the water are, are making things, skeletons or shells are made for the most part out of calcium carbonate. Um, and we're making it more and more difficult for all of them to function. So reefs are highly uh, vulnerable to all sorts of things, it turns out. Um, they're vulnerable to warming and they seem to be very vulnerable to acidification. So what these guys were looking at was what's happening to, to the growth rate of the reef. Um, are corals, you know, sort of slowing down in terms of how, how quickly they can assemble uh, this calcium carbonate that they need? And yes, indeed, that was what they found, uh, that, that actually the growth rate has slowed a lot. Right? Now, these corals were not yet, you know, dropping dead, but there's a lot of corals in the world that are dropping dead. Um, so, you know, the, the, the fate of reefs it really couldn't be more dire at this point, I don't think. I mean, I, f I think the, the reefs, reading about them in particular was, was really depressing because from the sounds of it, even if we do everything right, they're more or less doomed. They, they, they won't be able to keep up in this, this new hostile environment. I think it's very hard to construct a scenario under which reefs don't suffer tremendous damage, you know, over the next 50 years, it's very hard to say, okay, you know, if we do X and Y and Z and X and Y and Z are really radical things are like, you know, we have to cease emitting carbon tomorrow, basically. And even then it's not clear. So I think that the outlook is really bad. Now within bad, there's, you know, there's, there's gone entirely uh, and I suppose there are, um, you know, less bad shape, but, you know, but managed to get through this very difficult. I mean, I think what people often envision, and, you know, you can decide whether you consider this realistic or not, is that we're in some moment of sort of maximum impact, maximum population heading towards, you know, a, a population that should eventually peak, although it, you know, certainly has not yet. Uh, so, you know, we're adding people really, really fast to the planet. We're, you know, going to reach, you know, over, seems pretty clear unless there's some really terrible global disaster that prevents it, you know, going to hit over 9 billion people by the end, by the middle of this century. Um, so, you know, if eventually human population peaks and then starts to decline and then our impacts start to decline. So if you you know, sort of could get the planet through this, you know, particularly difficult moment, then maybe if, you know, if you if Reese could survive till the middle of the century, and then, you know, maybe things would, you know, sort of start to improve for the rest of the planet uh, as our impacts started to decline. But you have to imagine human impacts declining. And, you know, I'm not convinced, to be honest, that that is a realistic scenario. Hmm. You know, I, I hadn't heard of ocean acidification uh, until, you know, relatively recently in the past uh, year or two. And, you know, as I start to learn about it, um, I, I, again, it was it was quite depressing because as someone who hadn't looked into climate change that specifically, I think in the back of my head, I had the vague idea that, oh, well, maybe maybe we'll find a way out of it. Maybe maybe there's other solutions um, that we can come up with to to get the, the planet back into some sort of equilibrium. But of course, um, ocean acidification, no matter what we do, there's, there's no cure for that. The, the carbon in the atmosphere is, is going to inevitably go into to the water. Do, do you think that we've, we've largely overlooked the, the significance of, of what this has on the planet? Yes, I think that, you know, your experience is pretty, is pretty typical. We're not aquatic creatures. We, you know, have a lot of concern about the effects of climate change on land. Um, you know, there's a big drought right now in California that's woken a lot of people up. But, you know, we're never going to really feel the effects of, of ocean acidification in a deep and personal way because we're, we just don't live in the water. Um, but if you did live in the water, if you tried to imagine yourself as a coral for a moment, 
and and you thought your only interaction with the outside world was through the water, then you realize that the properties of, of the water are extremely significant. It's like as if you suddenly change the composition of the air, um, which would have a big effect, you know, on, on you and, and such basic functions as breathing, you know. So it's a huge and underappreciated problem. And as you point out, it makes, even if you could, there are all sorts of, you know, schemes that people have, have looked at, although, you know, not ever experimented on because they're very, very, very controversial, obviously, in terms of, you know, would there be a way to geoengineer our way out of climate change so that we literally were, for example, blocking, you know, a certain amount of sunlight and, and you know, sort of jiggering with the temperature in that way. But it doesn't change what's happening to the oceans and no one uh, has come up with even, you know, in their most wildest dreams, a way of protecting ocean chemistry as we continue to pour CO2 into the air. And so I think the lesson at the end of the day is you can't keep doing what we're doing and expect to have a good outcome. And, you know, anyone who tells you otherwise, ask them what they think of ocean acidification. How is that? To, to drive the, the point home, it, it's not just corals either. You, you went on a, a dive where the underwater vents uh, sort of naturally spew added carbon into the water. Could you tell me what you learned from that experience? Yes, that was in the Bay of Naples. A British scientist had come to the realization, this is about a decade ago already, I guess, that if you look at these areas, and there are areas of the water that people, you know, have known for a long time are naturally acidified because there's CO2 pouring out of the seafloor owing to, you know, volcanic uh, activity in the area. So, you know, this is pretty near Mount Vesuvius. It's a very volcanically active area. And there are these vents that just spew carbon dioxide. And, and often volcanic vents are also spewing other things like, you know, sulfur and and they're also hot, and so you'd say, okay, well, obviously, you know, that's bad for, for life around it. Now, this particular vent is a very, very useful little experiment because it's just spewing carbon dioxide and, and the gas is not hot. So you can really look at the effects, you can isolate the effects of ocean acidification. And that is exactly what they did. They, they looked at the life far away from these vents, so where the, the pH of the water, the chemistry of the water is, is relatively normal chemistry, you'd say, sort of typical Mediterranean chemistry. And then as you get closer to the vents, you see, okay, well, what can survive in this acidified water? And it turns out uh, that about a third of the species that you find outside the area of the vents are missing from the area near the vents. So, you know, that gives you a rough approximation. And, and this is at the level of acidification that we are expecting all oceans to experience by the end of this century. So we sort of continue on our present path. So, you know, to a rough approximation, uh, if that happens, you would expect uh, a third uh, of all marine species, you know, to be done in. And that's a pretty, pretty major percentage of the world to do in, uh, you know, in the course of the next 85 years. So I guess the more we, we manage to reduce emissions, the the sort of further out we stop before getting close to the vent. Exactly. Now, one thing I, I found particularly interesting in, in the book is you mentioned how we all have this sort of imagery of, of the polar bear as being the central sort of victim of, of climate change, one of the, the animals that will be most hurt. And, and just in general, we think of the polar regions. And of course, the polar regions are... Um, experiencing warming faster than, than the rest of the world. But you you talk about why species at the equator and the tropical regions might particularly be uh, hardest hit by climate change. And first to get a, a bit of the context you laid in the book, could you, could you tell me just about that that theoretical walk down from the, the North Pole uh, down one of the uh, meridians? Yeah, the, there's something in the scientific literature called the latitudinal diversity gradient and and that's just sort of a fancy you know latinate way of saying that the variety the number of species that you encounter increases as you move from the polar regions towards the equator and that's something that was recognized very early on sort of in the history of biology you know Alexander von Humboldt wrote about it um, if you travel from the temperate zones to the tropics you you can't help but notice it. How's that? 
And we now have lots and lots of inventories that suggest to us the scale of the difference. And one that I think is very striking is if you go to the boreal forest in Canada, which covers like a billion acres and is just a huge area, you're only going to find tw roughly 20 species of tree in that whole forest. Now, meanwhile, if you go to the cloud forest in the Andes, where I went with these you know, American researchers, and you could pick, you know, basically a probably 100 square meters or something like that, and you would find 20 species of trees just in that. Uh, and then you'd pick another 100 square meters and you'd find another 20 species, you know, so you would, these guys that I went with, they had laid out like 20 plots of um, two and a half acres each. So we're talking about roughly 50 acres and they'd found a thousand different species. So that gives you a sense of the scale of the difference in terms of diversity. Um, the tropics are just incredibly diverse. And then there are areas of the tropics that are called mega diverse. They're just phenomenally diverse. And people have struggled to try to understand you know, what is it about the tropics that makes them so diverse. And one of the, you know, without necessarily having the answer to, the, to that question, one of the things that pops out from this mega diversity is that species in the tropics tend to have very narrow ranges. They are abundant in one very, you know, small either altitude band or latitude band, and they that's where they find them. You only find them at that altitude, at that temperature range. And the sort of corollary to that when you think about it is, okay, as you start changing temperatures in the tropics, and as you point out, temperatures are changing fastest in the in the Arctic, but they're also changing in the tropics. As you start messing with those, then these potentially these animals or, or plants that are very tightly adapted to one temperature zone uh, are going to have trouble surviving. And they're either going to have to move, which is very difficult in the tropics. It's very difficult to move temperatures because the tropics are you know, just so big. So you have to migrate quite a long way to get to a different temperature zone. Or they're going to have to, you know, quote unquote, adapt to a new temperature. And it's very unclear what's going to happen. You know, and many, many people are looking at precisely that question, what's going to happen to the composition of forests, what's going to happen to the, to the mix of animals as, as temperatures rise in the tropics. Um, so that's a very, very active uh, field of inquiry. And could you see sort of how specialized the different trees and species were when on your journey there? Yes, absolutely. And you, um, you know, I don't want to claim to be, you know, a, a botanist by any stretch of the imagination, but I was with botanists. And one of the points they made to me was we were we were walking actually walking down so we started at around 12,000 feet and we were walking down to sea level over a course of several days and one of the guys said to me you know pick out a leaf that you see on this pathway you know a distinctively shaped leaf and then follow it down the mountain and you're only going to see it let's say for the next 100 meters or so because that is where you find this plant only at this particular, very particular altitude. You get 100 meters lower and you don't find it anymore. And, and so, you know, as I say, I'm not a botanist. I don't have a great eye for that sort of thing. But yes, you can see literally that, you know, these plants have very narrow ranges. And as you hit on in the book quite often, it, it's not necessarily uh, the change as much as the, the rate of change that matters. Yes. I mean, one of the things that these guys were finding was things were, were scattering, you know, plants were able now, trees were able to survive at, at higher latitudes. You were finding things in effect, you know, moving up the mountain as, as you would expect as temperatures warm, but they were, they were moving, you know, and I use that term sort of loosely uh, at very different speeds. So some were keeping up with, with the temperature change, but most were not. Now, we, we know from the record of ice ages, right, ice ages have come and gone. And interestingly enough, they have not been major extinction events. So we've had, we, we live or lived, I should say, before we started putting a lot of CO2 into the air, we lived at a time of, of recurring ice ages. So the planet would go through a cold period. Uh, our ancestors survived, you know, the latest cold period, uh, which was a, you know, long period of glaciation. This is why presumably there are, you know, were people in the Northern Hemisphere, the Bering Land Bridge was exposed by this huge drop in sea levels that occurred because so much water was tied up in glaciers during the last ice age. And 
so we know we you know we can we can look through pollen records we can we can look through people have done studies of beetle casings for example we have a pretty good sense of how things moved around the world uh, to survive you know this pretty dramatic temperature shift that occurred uh, during the last ice age so we know that animals are, are at least capable of dealing with colder temperatures than we have right now and that they and that they migrate in response to that but the ice ages came and went much more slowly um, than the changes that that we're affecting right now and also as I was sort of suggesting the ice ages made the world colder so right now we're making the world warmer, warmer than it's been in many, many millions of years, and we are also doing it really fast. So the question of whether animals can move in response to this and can survive these warmer temperatures, once again, that's an open question. It's a question that we are going to find out the answer to, unfortunately, because we are setting this vast, you know, sort of global experiment in motion before we have done, you know, the control test on it. Let's put it that way. Do you have any other personal examples of of species that are struggling to adapt to climate change that uh, for you is is um, captivating? Well, you it's not the sort of thing that you you know see in, in, if that makes sense. You know, I mean, there are many people looking at all sorts of different aspects of this, and you have to do many years of careful research. It's not something that you're going to, you know, sort of, as it were, see in your backyard and be able to trace it to climate change. One really interesting aspect of this uh, is that many, many reptiles, the sex of the offspring is determined by temperature. That's a really interesting and weird fact <laughs> for a being to get his or her mind around, but it's, it's the case. And so, you know, people are wondering whether you're going to get these weird sex cues, um, for example, in certain kind of, of, of turtles, that's going to effectively, you know, over a couple of generations, basically, what, you know, wipe out the species if you start really skewing, the, you know, the sex ratio. So there are all sorts of ways in which climate change could play out that are even, you know, not necessarily what you think, just I'm really hot and I eventually, you know, pass out from heat, um, you know, and that is possible for some. Uh, species, but um, you know there are all sorts of ways in which temperature changes can, can play out. They can play out in, just in terms of altering, you know, competitive relationships. So these are, you know, hugely complicated questions that we have. You know, we've just, in a sense, what we've done is like taken all of every every you know species on the planet, sort of thrown it up in the air, like a huge game of chopsticks, and then it's going to you know fall to the ground and. And what the result is going to be, we we really just don't know. And as I said, that is is going to be determined by two things. One, how far we push the system, right? So how much CO two we add to it, and two, you know, what just turns out to be the uh, flexibility um, of, of of all these other species. And and doubtless the answer is going to be very different. You know, some species are going to you know thrive. Um, they're going to find that they actually have a competitive edge in this new world. But many others, unfortunately, are probably going to be done in. You mentioned one one scientist theory that it will be rats that that survive and thrive in the, in this new uh, world, given that we brought them to to so many different islands and places. Yes, rats have proved themselves to be extremely you know resilient, extremely good competitors. And as you as you mentioned, we've brought them places that they didn't used to be, where they have just in some cases bred explosively and driven other creatures extinct. So, you know, if you want to look at what kind of, of animal is going to survive, you know, it, unfortunately, they're not always the ones that we find the most sympathetic. That's what we're doing. I wanted to know what it was like for you personally to write this book. Um, you know, you've been looking at these sort of things and our impact on the world, a negative impact on the world for, for quite a long time. But I mean, in this book, you you really do go to the ends of the earth. You go to some some of the most remarkable places that ordinary people would would never get to see and witness. Some of the most biologically diverse places. I think at at one point, uh, when you're in the Andes, the guide you're with points and says, uh, "Just in this range alone is probably one ninth of all the birds uh, on planet planet Earth." And of course, you were witnessing, and the reason why you were doing the book was to see the impact uh, that we were having, the, an impact that as you, you say, will last into the geological future that will, will likely be um, visible in the fossil record. What was that like for you just on a personal level? 
Well, you know, as as you're suggesting from that question, it was very it was very mixed and you know sort of weird and interesting and in some levels quite fantastic experience. And I, I did get to go to these amazing places, you know, like One Tree Island that are at, you know pretty much as remote as you can get um, in this world of ours today. But on the other hand, you know, we were always there. I was always there with people who were looking at, at, at human impacts on the planet. So it was, a, it was very interesting and, and, and somewhat almost schizophrenic experience. Schizophrenic in what sense? Well, in, in, in that I was sort of often awestruck by how extraordinary these places are, were and how remote they were and uh, how wonderful they were. And, and, and yet, you know, the scientists I was with were busy documenting how, even though they were, you know, very remote and and still in many places very very wonderful, how how rapidly they were changing and 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 being affected by things that were happening, you know, many many thousands of miles away. Obviously, you you interacted with so many scientists, but was there any sort of average takeaway you took from your conversations with them? Well, I think that they're you know from a scientist's point of view, um, and and this is one of the things I try to convey in the book that. You know, on one hand, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. They're seeing changes. You know, this generation of scientists is seeing changes that they were, many of them taught in graduate school, were impossible to observe. Um, and they're observing them. In some sense, it's just, wow, this is just amazing. Um, and on the other sense, it's, you know, an absolute sense of horror. So I, I think the scientists that I went out in the field with, uh, who often had to, you know, take me very difficult places to get to and, and spent a lot of time with me and were incredibly generous. And, and I attribute their generosity, you know, both to the basic generosity of, of people, but also to the fact that, you know, they really wanted to get this message out that, you know, you might not realize it because, you know, you know, your corner of, of Manhattan or, or, or Berlin or London or whatever looks just the same as it looked, you know, 20 years ago. But we are really, really doing something, um, as we discussed, we are really doing something quite, quite unusual and very, very destructive. And they really wanted people to to understand that, you know, before it is absolutely too late. It, that makes me think of the, the experiment you talk about that uh, a pair of Harvard psychologists did with using cards. Could you briefly explain that experiment? Yes, the card experiment is recounted in by uh, Thomas Kuhn in his uh, seminal work on scientific revolutions. And what they did in that experiment was they doctored some playing cards and they showed them to people. Uh, so, for example, you got a red, uh, you know, spade or, or a black diamond, and they tried to see what people would do with, these, with this weird situation. And, and they found that people were indeed quite flummoxed and they couldn't really uh, process this information because it didn't fit into the categories they were used to. And so they, they often tried to fit them into the categories that they were used to. They didn't just immediately sort of say, oh, wow, that is uh, violating the categories. They would sort of try to fit them into the categories. That he considered analogous to what we do with information that we find disturbs the paradigm. I mean, this is where we get the word paradigm shift from. Uh, that disturbs the, the the sort of reigning paradigm. We 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 try to to shoehorn it into the paradigm until the paradigm you know finally breaks down and someone says okay that this can't be done anymore and that's how we get in in, in Kuhn's version a, a scientific revolution. And I feel that's very parallel to the the idea of change too. We don't tend to want to change until we're we're kind of forced to change as humans, both both personally and as a species. And I was wondering, like at at the end of the book, you sort of come away and, and, you know, we're not offering any prescriptions. You do mention that we do have the capacity to act uh, altruistically. We do have the, the capacity to change when, when given certain information. And I was wondering where you think we are in this, this process. Like we're seeing changes, we're causing changes. Um, and obviously our, our behaviors need to uh, change as humans if we're going to stave off the worst of, of what we're causing. Do you have any thoughts on, on where we are in that, that process? You know, that's, that's a really good question, and I, I, I vacillate depending on sort of the news of the day, which, you know, suggests that I really don't know the answer to that. But, you know, sometimes I think that we are potentially near, you know, some pretty broad changes, maybe prompted by changing consciousness, maybe just prompted by changing technology. Um, but then sometimes 
I think, well, that I'm only looking at a very tiny slice of the world. Um, you know, meanwhile, uh, you know, that, you know, rainforests continue to be raised. Um, population continues to grow very rapidly. You know, so there's a lot of um, factors working in the, in the opposite direction. So I think, once again, we're living in, you know, very interesting times and the, and the question of whether we will change our ways uh, soon enough, rapidly enough, broadly enough to make much of a difference is very much an open one right now. And I, I guess that, that counts on, on so much on us being aware. And your book, for a lot of us, was that guide into the sense of of how incongruous the situation is and, and how much we do need to change. Um, I really enjoyed the book. And thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. That was my conversation with Elizabeth Colbert, the author of The Sixth Extinction. And that's all for The Elephant this time. This episode was made possible with funding from the CKAA, a European society of entrepreneurs, scientists, students, professionals, and policy officers working to create a climate resilient society. Find out more at ckaa.eu. The Elephant is put together by myself, Kevin Kanders, with Patrick Chadwick, and executive producer Matthias Gutz. If you have any feedback, uh, you can find The Elephant online at elephantpodcast.org. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at elephantpodcast. And if you like the show, consider writing us a review in iTunes or help us spread the word by telling a friend. I'm Kevin Kaners. I'll see you in two weeks' time. <laughs>